I hate cardiomyopathy. Not the concept or the pathophysiology, but rather the word itself. If we dissect it to its roots, it superficially seems to make enough sense. Cardio, from the Greek cardia, meaning heart. Myo, from the Greek mys, meaning muscle. Pathy, a roundabout descendant from the Greek pathos, and which today refers to a disease process. So cardiomyopathy means a disease of the heart muscle, which it is. So what's the problem? Consider the following question. Can a patient develop a cardiomyopathy as a consequence of coronary artery disease? I posed this question on Twitter, and after 1,625 votes, 90% said yes, as I would have without pause a few years ago. This condition is called ischemic cardiomyopathy. There are thousands of peer-reviewed papers in the medical literature, and for those who are burdened with the U.S. healthcare system, there's an ICD-10 code for it. But when you do a web search of cardiomyopathy classification, not one result includes it. Instead, you see either the traditional subtypes, hypertrophic versus dilated versus restrictive, plus two we usually forget, arrhythmogenic right ventricular cardiomyopathy, also known as arrhythmogenic RV dysplasia, and so-called unclassified, which contains conditions like Takotsubo. Or you see a more recent classification system that categorizes cardiomyopathies into genetic versus acquired versus mixed etiologies, but there is no mention of ischemic cardiomyopathy, a term we use in practice all the time. Why does this discrepancy exist? Pathologists will state that cardiomyopathy refers to primary diseases of the myocardium, the heart muscle itself. However, myocardial dysfunction secondary to valvular disease, hypertension, or atherosclerosis of the coronary arteries are not primary diseases of the muscle, so therefore they are not true cardiomyopathies. In other words, the term ischemic cardiomyopathy is inherently contradictory, according to pathologists. Now, we could solve this conundrum by distinguishing between primary versus secondary cardiomyopathy. Unfortunately, though, secondary cardiomyopathy has already been used to describe myocardial disease secondary to systemic diseases, such as amyloidosis, autoimmune disease, and infections, with no room allotted for other forms of cardiovascular-specific disease. Added to this, there's another problem with the traditional three-subtype paradigm that all U.S. doctors learn while studying for the Step 1 of the U.S. Medical Licensing Exam. It mixes genetic considerations, as in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and, in some cases, dilated cardiomyopathy, predominantly anatomic considerations, as in dilated cardiomyopathy, and predominantly physiologic ones, as in restrictive cardiomyopathy. Thus, a single heart can have features of more than one classic cardiomyopathy subtype. The net result is a ton of confusion for students and interns trying to learn cardiovascular medicine. Consider the following scenarios. A patient with uncontrolled hypertension develops left ventricular hypertrophy and subsequent heart failure. A student might conclude that, that this is hypertrophic cardiomyopathy because the patient has LV hypertrophy, or potentially restrictive cardiomyopathy because the thickened ventricle will be less compliant and have difficulty relaxing during diastole. The possibility that the patient has neither isn't even considered. Another scenario, a patient has an MI and subsequent LV systolic failure. An echocardiogram reports LV moderately dilated with EF 20%. Instead of framing this as heart failure or even ischemic cardiomyopathy, many students will misleadingly label this condition dilated cardiomyopathy because why would they not? The LV is dilated. In short, cardiomyopathy, the pathologic term, is not the same as heart failure, a clinical syndrome, which is not the same as LV dilation or dysfunction, which are echocardiographic findings. And this is not a trivial matter of semantics. There are similar problems with the terminology around the interstitial lung diseases, in which there are competing sets of terminology depending on whether the case is framed around the clinical presentation or around the radiographic appearance of the lungs. And there is confusing terminology around glomerular disease, in which the disease can be labeled according to presentation, according to the underlying etiology, or according to histological, uh, histologic appearance under the microscope. 
In all these cases, there is not a clean one-to-one -one correlation of clinical to pathologic diagnosis. In summary, the terminology we use in medicine can be confusing, and we should not be surprised when our trainees are confused, which is why I hate cardiomyopathy.